Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Laura Rosick. I'm the director of the Center for Southeast Asian Studies here at the University of Michigan, and I'm happy to welcome you. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are today. Just a reminder, um, during this webinar, your cameras, microphones, and chat have been disabled. Um, please, throughout the talk, submit any questions you have via the Q&A function, and we will address these questions at the end of the talk. There is live captioning enabled um, during this talk as well. Today, we'll have a few announcements from the center. We'll have our presentation, and again, we'll have our Q&A session directly after. Uh, we'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the International Institute and the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures. And we, of course, would like to thank the funding and support provided to us by the U.S. Department of Educational National Resource Center Title VI grant. We have some upcoming events. Um, one that we hope you take advantage of this weekend is a showing of the Donut King documentary. Um, we will also welcome one of our um, faculty, Melissa Borgia, from the, uh, who's an assistant professor of American culture. Um, this, from all accounts, I'll be there. I have not seen this yet, but is the really great story of Ted Nyoy, who is a Cambodian immigrant who started a um, donut revolution on the West Coast with Donut King, bringing over Cambodian refugees and starting an empire. Our next lecture will be April 1st by Jonathan Saha, who will lecture on racial capitalism and interspecies empire in colonial Myanmar. And so that's where we come to today's talk. Today's talk, I'm really happy to welcome our guest, Professor Jaya Jacobo, who will talk about pedagogies of trans femininity in the Spanish colonial Philippines from 1589 to 1864. Um, in today's talk, she narrates and describes a simultaneous disavowal and affirmation of trans femininity in the Spanish colonial Philippines within the apparatus of colonial cis, cis hetero patriarchy by looking at the narratives which mark out the emergence of the trans feminine in Catholic religious discourse and in its catechetical um, product of conversion. Um, we just had a nice conversation and found out that. Um, Professor Jacobo has just recently moved to England from the Philippines during the pandemic. Um, she's an assistant professor of gender equality and diversity at the Institution of Education at Coventry University in the UK. She was previously a postdoctoral fellow of the Philippine work package of the Global Grace, Genders and Cultures of Equality program at the University of the Philippines, which enabled her work along transvestite and transsexual women's artists, academics, um, and activists in Brazil. She is a founding editor of the Career Southeast Asia, a transgressive journal of literary art, and a member of the Board of Trustees of the Society of Trans Women of the Philippines. So please join with me to welcome her today for our talk. We're really excited to have her here. Thank you. And I will stop my share. Professor Jacobo, you can go ahead and share your screen when you're ready. Um, um, can you enable sharing? Um, I apologize, I just enabled. Okay, perfect. Can, can you see my PowerPoint? Look, it's perfect. Okay, yes. Um, good afternoon, magandang hapon. I'd like to thank the Center for Southeast Asian Studies of the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, especially Professor Laura Rosek and Mr. Jonathan Valdez for inviting me to speak this afternoon. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Jaya. I was born and raised in a city called Naga on the southernmost tip of Luzon, the largest Philippine island. My parents were teachers in the public rural, rural public school system of my country. I was educated in the capital, Manila, as well as in the heart of the American empire, New York. In the present, I'm however engaged in the United Kingdom. I work at Coventry and live in Birmingham in the West Midlands. Okay, for this talk, I'd like to develop the concept of trans pedagogy from a Philippine perspective. 
particularly through a critique of colonial gender during the Spanish colonial period in the Philippines, through texts from the early 17th century to the late 19th century. What I intend to intimate when I express the need to trans pedagogy is to name the cisgender nature of pedagogy itself, that it accepts the binary imposed by assigned sex, and that the educational apparatus itself proceeds from this privileging of cisgenerity. To trust in the trans possibilities of pedagogy is to open oneself up to an ethics of diversity and to imagine the gender diverse as humanly present among us in the world. What is also at stake in this discussion is an undoing and remaking of gender itself, which I hope to perform through the vernacular ethic of my idiom, the Philippine and its languages. As I conceptualize its procedure for this presentation, I like to think of the trans pedagogical as revealed by instances where the figure of the trans feminine appears in the Philippine scene. To me, these apparitions are instructive in designing the decolonial grammar that will enable us to unlearn and reteach gender for a time to come. Only when we have acknowledged the cisgender violence written all over these instances can we begin to draft a gender diverse programmatic, some sort of a syllabus on gender that internalizes the trans circumstance and allows it to be learned through queer feminist pathways. Let me begin by presenting um, these scenes from two chronicles on the conquest of the Philippine Islands written by Spanish friars in the 17th century. It is important to note, of course, that the Philippines was under Spanish colonial rule for more than three centuries from 1521 until 1898. The first is quoted from Pedro Chirino's Relacion de las Islas Filipinas. And the second is singled out from Francisco de Alcina's Historia de las Islas de Visayas in translation by Blair and Robertson and Leeds, respectively. First, Chirino. This pagan priest, while offering his infamous sacrifices, was possessed by the devil. Second um, quote from Alcina. Although their priestesses were ordinarily women selected by the devil, he also chose some effeminate men called Asom. In the indigenous world prior to empire, women in our islands were believed to have access to the divine feminine as priestesses called the Bailans or Catalonians. And because gender was not premised on assigned sex, but on social function, assigned male at birth persons were considered female and they were called bayog or asog when they performed the role of the priestess. In these particular scenes, the friar chronicler misreads the bayog or asog as anomalous beings, rendering their embodiment of the sacred as diabolical possession. It is the wrong spirit that turns the shaman's ontology into a false one. The trans priestess is represented as being in trance in order to teach that such frenzied magic only belongs to the fallen ones. As one reads uh, further into these religious accounts of conquest, the Bayugur Asu would be described as being free from the trance, but now remystified into the new faith that engenders her um, to perform a paradoxical role in the community. This is again from Chirino. To assist us in instructing the large number of catechumens in those villages and in teaching the doctrine to the innumerable children who assemble at the mission from all settlements, our Lord provided for that work an Indian blind in body, but truly enlightened of soul.
sorry about that. There was an Indian mute there whom they called Asom. This one was so effeminate that in every way, he seemed more like a woman than a man. In the pastoral ministry of the Catholic religion, the former priestess is given the role of a pedagogue. Note how the narrative maintains her subordinate status while performing a role that will further subjugate her fellow indigenes. Also consider the signifiers of disability. The biog asog is blind, mute, and her sexual anatomy as well as her desires are held in question. In the end, the semblance to power and authority only serves the colonial order. It inures her to further abjection and ascertains the final obliteration of the divine trans feminine. For it is a sacerdote, a cisgender male, that ultimately inherits sacred sanction in the name of, this, of the Roman church. The scriptural text that he will announce and the sacramental duties he will perform can only entrench what is asked of his gender. He shall relegate the priestesses either to witchcraft or sodomy, both domains of the devil in his angelic vanquishing of all manner of darkness in the colony. The word pedagogue comes from the Greek pedagogos, a tutor who is also a slave who walks a child to school. In Greek antiquity, the pedagogos is to be distinguished from the pedonomos, the school magistrate and the pedutes, an instructor who is a free person. Pedagogoi are trained in the pedagogium, an institute where young slaves are trained to serve in society. In this uncanny occupation that requires both authority and servitude, the pedagogue can only be a servant educator. It is important to remember the imperial orig origins of pedagogy and aspire to liberate whoever assumes the role of the pedagogue from pedagogy itself. What can a transgender professor do if the university itself is built upon this barbaric genealogy? One can only respond by setting the terms of the teaching and the learning of the gender of gender itself. And if one wills it, this task can only be initiated in a sincere but incisive critique of language. If I were to reconstruct Filipino vernacular pedagogy, the terms of teaching and learning are more or less reproduced between the acts of pagtuturo and pagkatuto or pag-aaral as practiced by the guru, the teacher, and the mag-aaral, the, the learner or the student. Suffice it to say, uh, this dyadic model also reinstates the hierarchical model critiqued by the Brazilian philosopher education, Paulo Freire. Pachigayatris Bivac, I propose to sabotage this hierarchy through the proposal of diversity that is inscribed upon the Filipino concept of gender. Casarian, whose invitation is to diversify identity as much as it classifies persons in the process. In the ensuing part of my talk, I cite linguistic instances within the colonial lexicon where the trans feminine appears in language. I particularly choose the trans feminine as vernacular of gender diversity as it offers an openness and fluidity that may be based on womanhood or femaleness, but also proposes further possibilities of non-binarity beyond what can be imagined from a transgender woman or trans female, but are confidently grounded on their figurations and embodiments. Femininity is an aspect of the female, of the woman that addresses quality as well as inflection, a stage or field where the woman is given an opportunity to demonstrate the integrity of her forbearance. To trans, the feminine can only be a most productive endeavor from this premise. In the vocabulary de lengua tagala, I'm sorry, bicol, my mother tongue, one finds a diverse array of declensions and conjugations of the Bikal word for woman, babaye.
The reader is presented permutations of womanhood that is performed in time and space through fashion and disposition, even in its citation of pretense. To my mind, even the colonial lexicon could not deny the repertory where womanhood could be lived out. The vocabulary of Lengua Tagala introduces woman, babahi, as either human or animal and names what could be translated into the transfeminine, the binabayi, a rooster who looks like a hen, if not a hermaphrodite. Here, the dictionary suggests that the transfeminine is contiguous not with a human female, but with her animal counterpart. Her anomalous body makes her more kin to the beast, so to speak. Notwithstanding the humanist supremacy that also installs colonial transphobia through the entry, I find it productive that this definition also points to tranimal ontologies and tranimate phenomenologies on being and becoming. The fundamental question of gender must also entail a final reckoning with a human after all. Relegated to a creature, the binabayi is incited into discourse both as an independent entity and a singular identity demarcating distinction from, but also claiming kinship with woman. To understand why the Binabayi would be treated as such, it is significant to remember how misogyny pervaded as a colonial condition during Spanish rule. These pages, from a grammar book from the late 19th century, illustrate how womanhood was defined in language. The lesson on adjectives uphold men as bueno and diligente, but when women are described, they can all be signified in terms of weakness. Las mujeres son flacas, the book instructs. Spain left the Philippines in 1898 after losing to the US in the Battle of Manila. But in the Diccionario Tagalog Hispano, a lexicon from the second decade of American rule, the bestiary that surrounds Binapayi seems to have expanded, further supplementing cisness, effeminacy, cowardice, and lesbianism to an already disparaged ontology of queerness, threatening the colonial institution that is indigenous masculinity. At this point, allow me to deepen my genealogical stipulation on the trans feminine in the Philippines by expanding the analysis through comparative Austronesian linguistics. Austronesian is one of the largest family of languages in the world and compassing languages and dialects in Taiwan, insular Southeast Asia, Polynesia, Micronesia, Melanesia, and also Rapa Nui, Easter Island in Chile and Madagascar in Africa. This global reach had been made possible by the maritime culture that originated in the island of Taiwan and spread to the east and west of the Pacific Ocean. From the screen capture of a page from the online corpus, Austronesian Comparative Dictionary, we see a comparative analysis of the morphology and semantics of Binabahi or Binabayi through nine Philippine languages. Semantically, the tropes of the effeminate, the hermaphrodite and the emasculated male still prevail. For example, in Cebuano, the rooster becomes a hen, if only for their plumage. Something else happens, however, when one concentrates on the morphology. In English, the prefix trans indicates a crossing or a traversal. Hence, um, transgender, the word transgender, signifies a crossing into a gender that affirms a true self that is aligned with sex, um, um, that it is aligned with, something's wrong here, the, the true self of the trans person. Sorry about that. In Binabahi, we see an exemplary operation of the traversal through an infix. The suffix does, does it work in the middle of the word where it is inserted. In Tagalog grammar, in performs its function in the past tense of the verb, signifying an act or process that had already happened, indicating the completion of the event. 
For example, kinain means someone had eaten something. Root word kain. As a noun, binabayi indicates a man prone to womanhood. That's what they say. But whose femininity is incomplete and hence invalid through cisness or effeminacy. Again, that's how the lexicons define the trans feminine, the binabayi. In a grammatical reading of, um, okay, of binabayi as a verb, however, the accent becomes um, into who they are through a process. With this framework in mind, binabayi can be translated as turned into a woman, binabae. I believe that this trans reading of Tagalog grammar proves most productive for post-colonial and decolonial feminism as this act of making posits Posits a process of becoming not only for women of trans and cis experience, as well as lesbian, queer, and non-binary orientations. Binabae in Tagalog, in this particular reading, means naging babae. I have become a woman. She has become a woman. To become a woman in such terms, through a certain traversal of the feminine, either an embodiment of it or something else, like its transformation altogether, only introduces this possibility along the lines of feminist solidarity. This infixity that is proposed by Pagkabinabayi, trans femininity, can be grounded on the phenomenology of Filipino philosopher Albert Alejo by way of Loob, as well as on the theory of performance proposed by Filipino art historian Patrick Flores through his concept of palabas. What we may witness from this dialectic between dwelling in an interior loob and the event that is venturing out into the outside labas is an emergence of a self always already embedded in an enclosure, but equally invested in an expanse out there. I interpret such a flux as a procedure of engenderment that is demonstrated by the kind of nascency and arrival that only the trans feminine in the name of the Binabayi can only perform. To extend the gesture of comparison, Binabayi is related to Pacific trans femininities, indigenous to Samoa, Tonga, Aotearoa, Tuvalu, and the Gilbert Islands. All these cognates of the Binabayi in the language spoken in these places translate into the, into, in the manner of a woman, such as the Samoan Fafa Fini, that said, unlike Binabayi, the manner of the woman is signified through prefixes and operates in a manner akin to the English prefix trans, except for Tahitian and Hawaiian. Mahu, a word unto itself without any suffix, translates into in the middle. Okay. I would like to temper my enthusiasm, however, on hoping too much on trans feminine futurity by sharing two textual instances where the Binabayi encounters the predicament of erasure at the same time that the promise of her resistance remains, however, bleakly. The Tagalog epistolary Urbana at Felicia by Modesto de Castro, translated into several other Philippine languages, and is considered a pioneer in the history of the Philippine novel for its evocation of the city and the country through an exchange of letters between sisters, Urbana, who is in a Beaterio in the capital Manila, and Feliza, the younger sibling in Laguna province. Reading within the tradition of the European novel of manners, critics have also pointed out that the etiquette perspicaciously described in the text is symptomatic of colonial governmentality, particularly on, on women. The chapters pertain uh, to um, manners on the table, how to dress, how to walk, how to become a proper woman, how to become a, um, a civilized person in the colony. I'd like to read further, however, and imagine the trans feminine constructed by this dialogue between two cisgender indigenous 
females, especially when Urbana at Feliza speak of their younger sibling, Onesto. Aking naisulat sa iyo ang madlang kahatolang ukol sa paglilingkod sa Diyos ngayon isusunod ko ang nauungol sa sarili nating katawan, the body. Sabihin mo kay Onesto na bago masuk sa eskwela, maghihilamos muna, suklayin, aayusin ang buhok, at ang barot sa lawal na gagamitin ay malinis, ngunit ang kalinisay huwag iukul sa pagpapalalo. Tell Onesto that before they go to school, they must wash their face, comb their hair, and that their shirt and trousers must be clean, but this cleanliness must not be excessive. This is um, Urbana to Feliza. And then Feliza to Urbana. Pagkaumagay, mananaog si Onesto sa halamanan, pipitas ng sangang may mga bulaklak, pinagsasalit-salit, iba't ibang kulay, pinag-aayos, ginagawang ramilyete. Inilalagay sa harap ng larawa ni Ginoong Santa Maria. Isang asusena ang inuukol para sa iyo, isang liriyo naman ang sa akin. At paghahain sa arena ng mga virgenes ay linalang ka pa ng tatlong abagi noong Maria. In the morning, Onesto descends to the garden, plucks flowers of various colors which they turn into a bouquet to be offered to the Virgin Mary at the altar. They would also choose one special lily for you, Urbana, another one for me. And upon offering to the Virgin, they would add to the bouquet three Hail Marys. In this conspiracy between virgins of the city and the country, the child is turned into a specimen that would endanger the future of patriarchy in the outpost of empire. But the boy does not become a man or Urbana and Feliza refuse Onesto be, to become a man. Raised in femininity, Onesto becomes the truth of the colony, a woman among others, pure and delicate among the blooms, enfolded into their own virginity, but also entitled into a world of tenderness and fragrance. fragrance. Sissy or effeminate, the figure of Onesto is where the vanquished non-binary trans femmes of the divine past stage their emergence in the late imperial culture of the colony and ensure a trans feminine future for women like myself in the present. Nonetheless, as the Binabayi becomes woman among other Babayi women, she also inherits all manner of suffering in the hands of indigenous men who lure her into believing love can ever be true for her kind of woman. Kagagaling lamang dito ni Bebe, ang patuloy ng lalaki ng samantalang sumasandok ng kanin at isa pang pinggang ulam si Aling Tolang. Si Binaba e po ba, tata? Oo. Ibinigay ba ninyo, nana, ang damit kong marurumi? Hindi at umalis agad, pagkasabi ng tata mo na kaalas kwatro lamang ng manaog kakahapon. At nagalit naman siguro sa akin ang buiset, ang naibulong naman sa kanyang sarili. Bebe had just left, the man said while the woman was preparing dinner. The binabae? Yes. Did you give her my dirty laundry? I didn't. She departed as soon as we told her you left soon after four in the afternoon yesterday. The nuisance must be mad at me again, he whispered to himself. Yamot na yamot na ikinahihiya pa ni Enrique ang pakikilaguya sa binabaing iyon, na animoy kung sinong talipandas at napagmahal na kabiyak ng kanyang bibib. Ngunit hindi niya magawa ang magalit o makipaglayo sapagkat malaking totoo ang kanyang pakinabang. Ano't hindi niya pagtitiisan ng gayong kakotsakot siyang pangkipagkaibigan ay ibig niya ang lagi nakagayak. Enrique was ashamed of his relation with the binabae, who acts as if she were not just a woman but also his wife. But he couldn't be furious and just leave. He benefited from her. How can he not endure their forlorn partnership when he wanted to appear like a fashionable man of the times? In these, fa in, fashionable, sorry. in these passages from the 1910 novel by Roman Reyes, Puso Walang Pag-ibig, A Heart Without Love, we see Enrique, who has already abandoned his wife and children in the province, living the life of a bachelor in Manila. 
often read as a critique of American modernity in a colony that had failed to liberate itself from a previous colonizer and is now serving a new master. The novel portrays how the aspiration to be modern destroys indigenous masculinity. And describing the Filipino male subject's toxic failure, however, the novel can only reproduce colonial misogyny, failing to offer any form of reprieve to the women who suffer from the men. In the end, they fail even more. If the man of their dreams is defeated by modernity itself, how can they even begin to dream for themselves, especially without this male figure? What I would like to point out here, however, is the male dependency on trans labor. We would have wanted to read more about how the Binabayi employ that productivity to her advantage. But then again, this is another novel in my mind from a contemporary reverie. During the past 30 minutes or so, I have labored to demonstrate the pedagogical value of trans femininity as a critique of colonial gender through a genealogy of the Binabayi as a categorical facticity in the languages of the Philippines. In considering the Binabayi as a vernacular of trans feminine, I trust that I have shown a procedure of translating transness as well as transforming womanhood in the terms of femininity from a global South methodology. I'd like to conclude my talk by sharing a couple of images from a pictorial that was commissioned by Wang Binghao, non-binary curator and art historian from Singapore, when they asked me to write for the Modern Museum of Art in New York City last year. These portraits are offered to us by Malvin, Mark, and Jazar, Binapayis of the House of Pacolor, whose mother, Philippine non-binary artist, Carlo, Carlo, yes, has generously assembled for the world to see the irreverent fulsomeness of contemporary trans feminine beauty. Madam Salam, thank you very much. Thank you so much for that talk. That was, um, I, I, won't, I think I might go back and rewatch that. That was really great. Um, it really thought provoking. Does anyone have any questions? Our question and answer is not, we don't have anybody in there yet, but please go ahead and um, ask some questions. I'm wondering, and again, coming from a very naive understanding of what you do, how common is this in other Southeast Asian countries that were um, colonized, especially not by Catholics or people who practice the Catholic faith? Uh, which which one? Which which part of the? I mean, the, like the trans femininity? You mean? Um, yes, exactly. The trans femininity. Yes, uh, I believe there. Um, uh, this is. Um, can I say? Um, but prevalent. It's always been there in Southeast Asia, I and mean, I can cite uh, the warriors of Indonesia. The the Catholics mm -hmm. of Thailand, um, uh, the the Maknya of, of Malaysia. Mm -hmm. I mean, shared um, uh, identity, you know, because of um, a notion of femininity of of, of femaleness uh, prior mm -hmm. to uh, colonial rule. Um, so, um, uh, to be female in at least in the Philippines, um, as um, what remains from the archives um, show um, is that um, it's not based on what they call biological sex, but yeah. it's also function. And mm -hmm. because of that uh, openness and diversity, um, being a woman um, opened itself up to, uh, to this particular trans possibility. And I'm, of course, I'm using trans from the contemporary. So, um, uh, and that's why I do this kind of um, history, history, this mm -hmm. genealogy. I'm a literary scholar, but I've always find it productive to look at the past, to understand myself mm -hmm. and my community in the present and imagine a future of possibility because um, the present for my community is still being fought and struggled with, you know, especially, you know, back home in the Philippines. Yeah, your, your, your examples really illustrated that, I thought, but now, uh, Monique Van Reenen wanted to ask a question. She's our grad assistant, so I'm since she can't type, I'm asking her to unmute and go on un, and unvideo and go ahead and ask. Hi, Monique. Hi, thank you so much, Laura. Um, 
This is fascinating. I, as someone who works as a linguistic anthropologist, um, I'm particularly compelled by your analysis and your focus on language and its performative capacities to, to kind of construct and erase identities. And I, I probably have several questions and I'll keep kind of keep to um, sort of the, some of the, the main things that I'm interested in, but um, I, I'm really curious about these dictionaries, these dictionary um, entries that you, you showed it towards the beginning of your presentation and thinking especially of the way that these lexicons are constructed and in this case as man-made colonial constructs. Right. Um, right. That take the authority of meaning making and defining categories of being, um, whether it be kind of male and female and um, effeminacy and um, and it's it, it's really interesting as well thinking about the the linguistic contact that happens there between Spanish and Tagalog right. and ways that translation is is also doing this work of of both creation and erasure. But I'm curious in thinking about this kind of colonial imposition of language mm. and erasure that happened through that if they're kind of what that role of creating this um taking the power of creating a lexicon either erased or created identities that might not have been there in the first place or were there and were taken away um, yeah, yeah yeah um wonderful commentary and question, Monique. Um, these lexicons were used by the friars to further evangelize the country. It's not really for the usage of the indigenes, you know, but for um, their colleagues in, in evangelizing the, the country as well as administrators. So you're right in pointing out that um, uh, these lexicons have a way of visibilizing these identities. At the same time, because um, these friars were just accessing them at a very, um, uh, the contact zone was raw, but um, fresh as well. I mean, they might have missed a lot of other um, bodies and um, self-identifications from the natives themselves. And um, as a, as a lit literary scholar trained in close reading, I allow myself to imagine through the particular limits of language, you know, in, in opening up the text, you know, I mean, these dictionaries are wonderful because the friars, from, from my end, of course, you know, because the friars um, in, um, the, uh, especially the vocabulary de, de la lengua tagala, the, the entries, um, because the friars could not really understand words, you know, they, they at some point recorded poetry, you know, that were given to them by um, the peoples of the islands. And, um, and when, when poetry, so, so it's, it's um, um, I don't know if, if this, this ha had happened in other parts of the Spanish empire, but when, um, when the poetic text enters the lexicon, that's when um, the, the reading becomes exciting because uh, uh, there's metaphor um, and, um, and the, the friar, even when he just really wants to record is compelled to do literary explication as well you know so um um and uh, these you have to give it to these friars um the you have to read from 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 the index to the to the front to the middle uh, there's a way to handle the, these um, colonial texts. Um, and I had to learn it uh, through the years, um, excavating these sources from, from the Philippines and online as well because of the pandemic. But yes, um, uh, language for me is important. Um, and uh, uh, if, I, if I may, um, uh, I, I conducted a rapid assessment um, uh, survey among um, trans women through my org during the pandemic. 
And uh, I was surprised to, to see somehow see this particular identification, you know, because uh, um, some women, quote unquote, try, could not identify with trans, but would identify with not just being a bai, but other vernacular terms to refer to this kind of womanhood. You know, like um, for, for them, uh, trans women were myself and other women in the city who had access to a, you know, privilege and capital. So um, that was instructive for me as well. These um, uh, residues, so to speak, of the colonial past, of, of the antique past, you know, in the contemporary present. Through that, through that um, could you call that field work? And I know that this is a, um, it might be easier for you to ask their questions. So if you want to be unmuted, go ahead and um, put that in your Q&A. And Monique, you said you had another question. If you'd like, go ahead. We've got a quiet audience today. Yeah. But that was, uh, that was dense. It was a fascinating. No, but question. it's fascinating. And I, I was a former literary scholar who moved into, um, out of the, the archives and into people's lives. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I mean, even, uh, the entries on man, on Lalaki, are also interesting. I mean, um, I haven't really looked into that, but it's another study, it's another chapter for my manuscript. Yeah. And I'm curious too, because um, in thinking about what you just said about ways that. Um, that people identify right with with gender and and the language that they use that it's immensely important in thinking about when you're um especially i think as someone who's who's based in the united states and uses english as a primary language um and then works in i i work in indonesia and mm. have other linguistic repertoires um that i have access to that aren't as have an emphasis on on gender especially for like pronouns and things mm -hmm. but I, I i i'm thinking about what you said about trans Mm -hmm. as a prefix but also i i don't speak tagalog but um this infix is a procedural marker yes and the recognition kind of what that or kind of your understanding of what that type of language as an option for people to identify with does to rupture these pervasive binaries that we have in ways that aren't perhaps not as polemic as issues Right in English about um, they as a gender neutral pronoun where people get um, really bothered by that for different reasons, but thinking about like instead these other ways that language really does offer us um, ways to think beyond just male female, um, but gives options for for gender queerness or for non binary folks and um, and acknowledging right that there that there's a you know, processes of identity that are involved and, and honoring that, I guess. Um, yes, um, much work on uh, trans linguistics, um, if you will, in the US, in the Anglophone world, um, begins with this philology of trans, you know, I mean, and Susan Stryker has done wonderful work on that. But I just thought that because I was studying colonial grammar, you know, I also read, you know, I mean, um, confessionals, sermons, all of these things. Um, I just thought that, you know, I mean, as a literary scholar, I should also study linguistics and find um, in categories and, um, you know, um, of grammar, of, of language, ways to um, counter you know, the grammar of cisgender males. And um, I've been reflecting on this word for, for a long time because um, uh, I've been called Binabai when I was a kid. I mean, there are other ways to call, you know, um, to call out, so to speak, you know, identities. I've, I've written on another word, bakla. Um, but in, in the province, in Bicol, I've always overheard Binabai spoken against me, you know. But I thought, um, you know, I mean, 
growing into this particular journey and so figuring out ways to move forward. And it was through uh, the advice of, um, of a linguist in, in the University of the Philippines, uh, Jesus Hernandez. He told me that, Jaya, you know, I'd like to acknowledge Tuting, who's uh, Jesus for, for that. Um, uh, you should study Binabayi because um, it may be residual, but it, it's our link to Pacific trans femininities. And then, um, but he said, I won't give it away to you. So I took it as a challenge. And I was wondering for all these years, why to Tuting, that's his nickname, told me I won't give it away. It's because of the infix. And I'm, I'm, it's, I'm still not deep into it, but I want to study infixes, you know, especially in the Pacific and how they work and um, how anthropologists, linguists have studied this because um, it proposes um, not a different kind of, of trans possibility, but a trans possibility from within. You know what I mean? Like it's a, it's a transness from within. It's always been there. That's why I find it productive to connect it to uh, Philippine philosophy. Um, we have this um, uh, vocabulary on the interior and on the exterior. And um, I've always I wondered how to, to um, to link these notions of the interior and the exterior performance and, uh, and consciousness through a figure. And I thought that the Binabayi could be that figure, you know. And uh, for further on, um, because I, you know, you know, I, I, I still find myself loyal to queer studies, you know, I mean, I find it, you know, um, they call it uh, trans studies as uh, evil twin, but for me, you know, that's that's how you treat your sister. You know, I mean, um, you you're in um, harmonious discord, and I said I want to queer this term uh, further. You know, being a bai. I said, oh my god, being a bai could also be a verb. You know, like, um, uh, and when I when I when I saw that opportunity, I said, oh my god, this could be a. a a feminist possibility to address um, exclusionary uh, tendencies within feminism itself. You know, I don't need to convince everyone, but this is a theoretical framework through and from which um, women, you know, could be included, embraced in a particular linguistic framework. No, I find that immensely compelling, and I was was thinking as, and I. I mean, it's preaching to the choir in terms of looking at language as the site of this work. But I was thinking about um, in queer theory, but thinking a lot about and in feminist theory, but like especially how much traction like Judith Butler's theory of gender as performance and body practices are. And and thinking about I, I really like what you said about this idea of the infix and the reflection of something right internal to it that I think that kind of of analysis misses, and also, I mean, in in this this idea, right, of of decolon or decolonizing work. I mean, it's it's I think it's absolutely necessary, and it's it's been really wonderful to hear you talking about this from from a Philippine context because so much of this is dominated, right, by by Western queer theories, and in, in other places, I know, like queer theory in Indonesia, it doesn't get a lot of traction because of these um, right associations of of it being. Yeah. unacceptable and things. And I think being able to, to speak about it in the way that you do both historically and contemporarily is really helpful for thinking about, you know, what does this look like um, without privileging um, the kind of like Western dominant scholarship that we have. And, and that gives it that space for, for imagining and expanding, which is really exciting. Also, apologies for dominating the conversation. No, that's okay. Jonathan had a question too. We were just chatting. Um, sorry, this has been really fascinating. Jonathan, if you wanted to go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Hi, Jaya. Uh, so I actually just came up more with two questions. So the first question I have written up to Laura is, um, is it a regional usage that you noticed that, that you begin to see this difference between Binabayi versus Bakla? Because I, I know, at least for me growing up, 
the association of bakla has always been towards behavior or at least like from what people would say um filipino men exhibiting right. effeminate behavior whereas that would not necessarily be used towards uh women that you know um them in, like showing uh more masculine behavior so i'm wondering uh what does the term bakla preclude okay. uh, more in terms of contemporary motions of um, expressions of identity that Bina Bayi makes available for possibility? And then I think my second question is, with the motion to, to sort of bring back uh, Phil, uh, Philippine writing systems, uh, mm. is, is have you seen any sort of write, like motions that where Philippine writing scripts have demonstrated more about gender than just a uh, Roman, Romanized script? Wow, um, wonderful questions, Jonathan. Um, first, uh, I, um, Bakla is the, if I may, um, would be the Filipino um, cognate to queer. It embraces, it embraces, you know, not a lot of trans women identify as bakla, but it embraces gay men, um, trans women, trans femmes, also um, um, women allies. You know, I mean, there there are cisgender femmes who gladly embrace being called babai and bakla. I don't know how to translate that. Babai is woman, bakla is is it's the, it's the more disseminated word to disparage maleness, you know, but it's been reclaimed by um, scholars as well and the community activists as um, decolonizing form of um, queer trans gay gender, you know, and um, uh, and that's the beauty of it, you know, Bakla existed alongside Bina Bayi. Uh, they, they conversed uh, with each other Although, um, interestingly, um, bakla, um, unlike the binabayi, uh, the word binabayi has always been associated with someone, a person. Bakla, um, uh, philologically, linguistically, was only associated with, uh, quote unquote, effeminates later on, because it's or, uh, originally bakla me meant, um, wonder, wonder and fear of the unknown, of the divine, of nature. So uh, if I could translate it, bakla uh, described a feeling of, of um, a human feeling towards the sublime, you know. But uh, the, again, the, the lexicons twisted it in such a way that bakla became at some point uh, associated with um, uh, a weakening form of masculinity, you know? Um, so um, uh, so in, in, in that sense, um, um, Sony Kuranyas of um, Michigan, he, he, they graduated from Michigan now in somewhere in the five colleges, associates Bakla with debility, with disability. You know, with, with crypt theory, I think uh, their manuscript is coming 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 up soon from Duke University, and I'm very excited for them. So, yeah, um, and there are regionally there are other uh, words, you know, Agi in the Visayas, Bayot in Visayas as well, um, Mark Johnson on the Bantut in Mindanao, um, you know, um, and like what Monique said, maybe um, some other identities were erased because they were not just transcribed by the friars. And then, yeah, I mean, anything for a trans archeology span of knowledge, I welcome it, you know. Um, and for the, the question on, on writing systems, um, I never got to learn um, by Bain or Alibata, but, um, there uh, I think if, um, but there are no, there are no 
extant texts. There are, there are, I guess, the Laguna Copper Plate, but, but I have yet to um, explore that. Um, maybe if I, if I read more deeply, I could, um, I could queer it. But um, did, were you asking about activism and focusing uh, uh, be, beyond um, uh, the exoticism of bye buying? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, before I left, before the pandemic, I think the government was proposing, oh God, like uh, two. Um, in, in, the, in the stations, you know, the train stations to, to put by buying as well, which, which is like pedagogically impossible because no, it's not, it's not taught or I don't know how that will be possible, how that will be employed and why we should return to that particular nostalgia. I mean, I have yet to be convinced on the uses of that particular past. But yes, it, it existed. Yeah, I mean, the, the, that syllabary existed. And uh, I, maybe if I looked at it, look at it and, um, and transcribe Binabai from the syllabary, I'd have another insight, but I haven't done that yet. Awesome, thank you. Well, it's just about one. So we wanna make sure that we thank um, Professor Jacobo and for this really compelling talk. And again, if you would like a recording, this should be up on our um, page pretty quickly or email cs at umich.edu. So thank you so much for this talk today. Thank you so and much. And we will see you next time.